Did you know you could support my podcast with a small monthly donation? That's right. You can choose from three different donation options as little as $1 to $10 monthly. Don't get me wrong, this podcast will always be free to listen to. This is an additional option to support my podcast and ensure future content. I will leave a link in the description where you can click to donate. For joining me. I thought it was the longest week waiting for episode two in the Snapchat murder series. If you were just stopping in and haven't listened to episode one, make sure to go back and listen so you were caught up or you can do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. I'm not your mom. Also, apologies for last week's intro music that was four flipping minutes long. I added the entire song instead of my 30 second snippet, so... On the bright side, that was probably the most lit four minutes of your day. So here we go. Episode two in the Snapchat murders. A brief recap of last week, we discussed the timeline of January 13th, the day Abigail Williams and Liberty German went missing. They were found the next day, February 14th, 2017. The autopsy of the two girls were never released to the public. In fact, not much has been released besides the audio found on Libby's phone and the infamous photograph and sketch of Bridge Guy. We went over the composite sketch, a Caucasian male, five to six feet tall, 180 to 200 pounds, and looked to be in his 30s to 50s with reddish brown hair. In this episode, I'd like to go over a few leads that they've had, a few suspects on their list, and as well as throw around some speculation swirling this case. I normally like to have proven facts, but in this case, I think speculation and theories should be taken into consideration. So I'm eager to hear if any of you have the same opinions or similar theories. Let me introduce Daniel Nations, then 31, who was a Colorado resident. Daniel had been a convicted sex offender since 2007. He had a bad track record for indecent exposure, exposing himself, and public indecency, fondling his genitals in a women's public restroom while peeping on them. What brought Daniel into this particular case was the fact he had once lived 100 miles from Delphi, Indiana, in Martinsville. In a farmhouse Daniel lived in, the owner-landlord stated, quote, something was not right about nations, and that he destroyed their property with a hatchet and ruined part of the electrical system. They contacted police several times and eventually had him removed from the property by a court order. In a Facebook post from Daniel's wife, they moved to Colorado in May 2017 for a fresh start. Back in Colorado, Daniel Nations was arrested for allegedly threatening several people with a hatchet on a biking nature trail. He was arrested in a vehicle with expired Indiana license plates. Daniel admit to having a hatchet in his vehicle, but denied threatening anyone. There are many alarming similarities between Daniel and the bridge guy suspect, but Sergeant Kim Riley, spokesman for the Indiana State Police, made a statement stating they are investigating every lead brought to their attention, but that it is too early on to draw a connection between Daniel and the Delphi murders. Paul Etter then 55, was an Indiana resident wanted for kidnapping and the rape of a 26-year-old woman. The woman claimed to have gotten a flat tire where she pulled into Edder's driveway around 4.30 a.m. Edder asked the woman if she needed help, but the woman didn't feel comfortable and declined and continued to drive on her flat tire down the road. Now, just a thought, who the hell is awake at 4.30 a.m.? and goes outside to ask if somebody needs help changing a tire. Edder followed her, and 
Once she pulled into a friend's driveway down the road, he handcuffed her and put her in his car. He then took her to his family's farmhouse, where he assaulted her for five hours before driving her back to her car. I mean, come on. You dropped her off at her car after raping her for five hours. She knows what driveway she pulled into. You don't think that she's going to tell the authorities. Real smart. Edder was stopped by police in a stolen pickup. Once stopped, a five-hour standoff began and ended in Edder killing himself. Tippecanoe County was the county where Edder was accused of this rape and arrested. Tippecanoe County was actually the ones who tipped off Carroll County investigators where the girls went missing and bodies were discovered on information on Edder, but has not been updated since if he is in fact a fit to the crime. Another person of suspicion was Thomas Bruce. He was a former pastor who shot and killed a woman and sexually assaulted two others. These crimes were committed in broad daylight. What caught the attention in the press was his similar stature of 5'7 to 5'9", as well as wearing a flat cap and blue jacket during the attacks. Police looked into the possible connection, but no further word. Ron Logan was another person of interest. Ron Logan owned the 30 acres of which Abigail and Libby's bodies were discovered on. On May 17th, 2017, Indiana State Police, FBI, and Carroll County Sheriff's Department served Ron Logan with a warrant to search his property. After the discoveries of the body on Ron's property, he made a statement, quote, that was like being hit with a bolt of lightning on my property. You just can't put words into it, he said. It was something I couldn't get my emotions around. You can't believe that something this terrible in this community happened here on my property, in my backyard. Ron Logan told authorities he was buying a tropical fish at the time of the girl's disappearance, and here's why. Ron, 77, had been on probation since 2014 for operating a vehicle while intoxicated and was a habitual traffic offender, so he was not able to drive at this time. After evidence and testimony of Ron's whereabouts being spotted drinking at a bar and making a trip to the dump, Ron then admit later he did in fact drive to the dump the day of the murders, and he was charged with a parole violation for operating a vehicle. He was sentenced to two years for that parole violation, and police are saying he is not a suspect and have ruled him out. It is unknown if or what the search of his 30-acre property turned up. That does it for all the known potential suspects in the case, but I wanted to introduce George Webb. He is a reporter that travels the country digging up news stories. The Delphi double homicide caught the attention of George Webb, and he traveled to Delphi, Indiana, to see what he could investigate on his own. George speculates the killings have signs of being a cover-up. George summarized there being no public reconstruction of the crime, no release of forensics, no autopsy report or rape kit released, no time of death, no description of wounds. The parents didn't speak out until two months after the murders, suggesting police wanted to maintain control over the investigation. George also summarized the FBI had received over 100,000 tips, and the FBI had released an image of a suspect, but Webb believes there are three to four people involved in the murders. George confirmed speaking to friends and family of the girls and claimed that the girls were indeed strangled. One of the girls is said to have been almost decapitated from the strangulation. These unknown sources informed George of the possible item used to strangle the girls was a garrote. George also confirmed the girls were in fact raped along with dismemberment of their bodies. It's speculation that Libby may have lost a finger trying to fight off the garrote strangulation. Webb claims there was two sets of DNA discovered at the crime scene, leading him to speculate there was more than one attacker. For those of you who are not familiar with what a garrote is, it is a handheld weapon most commonly made with chain, rope, scarf, wire, or even fishing line. It is used to wrap around the neck and even cut into the neck, slicing into the carotid arteries. 
This method is also used as a silent kill. The garrote wrapped around the neck and pulled tight would restrict you from talking, screaming, and breathing. This particular weapon was actually the murder weapon used in the 1996 murder of jean Benny Ramsey. I will come back to George Webb and a little more about his investigation. His videos can be found on YouTube. I will also add some audio of George's trip to Delphi, Indiana, where he made a video walking the exact trails that the girls were last seen on and discovered. Okay, day 187, I'm at the bottom of uh, the hill here in Deer Creek. Um, now, supposedly the only evidence we have of the murder is where the guy says, just for a little bit, down the hill, down the hill. And I can tell you right now, walking up this hill, down this hill, uh, is, a long, is a long hill. Uh, the other thing I noticed about this walk, and I don't know if the girls made this walk or not, I don't know where the bodies were found because there's a fence now around the man on high bridge um but one thing i can tell you it's very isolated uh, there's nobody around here um and i don't know if a scream would be heard or not now, there's some houses up there on that hill over there in the distance uh, but for the most part uh yeah this would be a good place to uh, do a murder uh, let's say this is the girl the, the garret goes over their neck around their neck the person clutches for the rope then now they're silenced and another twist around the garret pull back on the garret and now they're choked now they can't talk on december 14th 2017 the grandparents of liberty german and the mother of abigail williams appeared on the dr phil show you can also find clips of the episodes on youtube On February 14th, 2018, the first anniversary of the murders, police had received up to 30,000 tips. The next anniversary, this last year, 2019, tips went up to 38,000. Up to date is 52,000 tips. Law enforcement has even advised people to only submit tips and to leave the investigation work to the professionals. There were lots of social media chat groups made where people were comparing mugshots next to the composite sketch and rumors began to fly. Investigators do read through each and every tip submitted, so this makes it very difficult for investigators to weed through the relevant versus irrelevant. So what makes a good ideal crime tip? If possible, include names, remember dates and times, how this person is linked to Delphi or Indiana, and leave contact information so police can follow up with you. April 22nd, 2019, the public was shocked when Doug Carter with Indiana State Police announced in a press conference the investigation was taking a new direction. In the news conference, a new composite sketch was released. The old composite sketch then became secondary. It is not said or released why and how this new composite sketch has become the new face of the suspect. The new sketch appears to be a much younger man, and it was said that the sketch may appear younger than his actual age. Now with the age range being 18 to 40 years old. Quite a huge gap in my opinion. Doug Carter also expressed that he believes the suspect is still in Delphi or visits often and knows the area well. He even addressed the suspect personally and called him a coward. Also released was a video snippet of the bridge man taking two steps, only three seconds long, but shows a small image of his style of walking, his stature and demeanor. The new audio clip released at this time only adds one more additional word than the last audio clip. This new clip states, quote, guys down the hill. I want to go into a little speculation and theories of my own. There is a new test available that can create a composite sketch of the suspect using DNA. This test is called phenotyping. This test requires DNA and only gives a prediction of what the DNA sample may look like. For example, things that are tested and accumulated to create the sketch is sex, 
skin color, eye color, hair color, freckles, age, body mass, ancestry, and race. I have seen a Dateline episode where they experimented with this test and compared the sketch to the actual DNA sample, and it was outstandingly accurate. The sketch is made on a computer not drawn, so it obviously appears animated and not realistic like a picture would appear. Now this is just speculation, but in my opinion, I believe this test is the case for the new sketch released. Law enforcement has never confirmed exactly what they recovered from the crime scene, such as DNA, hair samples, clothing items. I, however, believe that there was some form of DNA recovered. My second guess would be a new witness came forward and gave a description of the suspect as well. However, law enforcement has stated that this is the new sketch that we should all refer to when identifying this man. The video released of the man walking on the bridge only shows a few short steps. Now, people may wonder why more of the video wasn't released, although Doug Carter did make a statement in an interview stating, someday we will know why they didn't release the full video. Something else to take into consideration is the condition of the bridge. The bridge was in bad shape, missing railroad ties and big gaps, so this may not be the natural way of walking for the suspect. As I had mentioned in the previous episode, that I think investigators ultimately want a conviction. They want this man put away for good. So if that means only releasing as little of information as possible to get the public's help, that would ultimately be safer than risking a possible technicality and getting a case thrown out. Doug Carter has made speculation that the suspect lives in the area or is still in Delphi, and so I don't think that they want him to know exactly what evidence they have. Lastly, I believe that the investigators want to respect the privacy of the families and the victims themselves. This was a very sensitive and brutal murder. Guess what? Yep, that wraps it up for episode two in the Snapchat murder series. This definitely is not the last episode in the Snapchat murder series, so in the future you can expect some more episodes. I would just prefer to dig a little bit deeper into this case and have some good information and hopefully new information or leads to give you in the future. You know what time it is. Yep, it's time for another one of my corny jokes to lighten the mood. So why did the banana go to the doctor? Because it wasn't peeling well. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to go follow me on Instagram where I upload photos from each weekly case so you can put a face to the crime. This week on Instagram, I will be uploading the new composite sketch as well as the short video of the bridge guy. If you liked this episode, don't forget to subscribe, follow, leave me a rating, and share with your friends. The more listeners, the more sponsors. The more sponsors, the more content for you. I have set up my Anchor support account, which is a monthly donation option to support my cast. I will leave links to my Patreon account in the description as well. If we are able to get enough Patreon supporters, I will be releasing exclusive content to my monthly supporters, such as early episode releases, more episodes weekly. Don't forget, this is only an additional option. Listening and sharing is all the support I ask from you. My podcast will always be free to listen. Just remember, I do this on my own spare time between a full job and two kids. These episodes require a lot of detailed research and time to record and edit. Thank you all for listening once again. Join me next Wednesday for my newest episode. Until then, stay weird, my friends. Oh, and one more thing. Hi, Mom and Maddie.